Welcome to Game Data. This week we're taking a deeper look into the Steam Controller and how it actually feels to use it in the now times here in 2022. In the last video, we looked back on why this controller exists at all and why it may have not been more widely adopted. If you haven't yet, I highly recommend going back and checking that video. Hey, I even put a nifty little link on the screen so that you can go and do that. How cool. In this video, we'll delve a bit deeper into the controller's actual functionality and if, you know, it's actually a controller I'd recommend using over something more basic like an Xbox controller. For some general notes before we get started, this video is very Windows heavy simply because it's what most people, including myself, are going to be playing games on most of the time if they're playing games on PC. Um, that isn't to say that a lot of this doesn't also apply to something like macOS. I've actually tried a bunch of features on macOS as well, and they seem to be very similar. There just might be slight connection related issues depending on what you're doing and the actual context of what you're doing. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get started. Okay, first things first, let's start by getting the controller actually connected. For this, we have three potential options. One, a dongle, two, a micro USB cable, and three, Bluetooth. The dongle came in the box with the controller and allows for a wireless connection with lower latency, compared to Bluetooth at least. As long as you have an open USB-C port on your computer, the only real downside compared to a wired connection is the need for AA batteries to keep the controller running. In my personal experience, the batteries last for quite some time though, similar to an Xbox controller. Plus, rechargeable batteries are really easy to get a hold of these days. Either way, any wireless connection is as easy to set up as holding down a couple of buttons while starting up the controller. It's actually pretty neat because connections to multiple devices can be stored and accessed with just a couple buttons. As someone with a ton of devices I use this with, that's something I can really appreciate. Worth noting, Although you can use the controller without Steam, it's a good idea to initially set the controller up using Steam's controller settings. As well as managing the connections, this allows you to set up default settings for the controller. In general, without any extra setup, expect it to behave kind of like a standard Xbox controller inside games, at least within Steam. If you have the controller connected outside Steam, it's still actually pretty neat because the controller acts just like a set of mouse and arrow keys. The right pad controls the cursor, right and left triggers for right and left click, and the left pad acts as a scroll wheel with a handful of typical navigation keys filling out the rest of the face buttons. It's a pretty intuitive layout and can be a bit easier to use in spaces where using a standard mouse is more cumbersome, like, you know, when sitting on a couch. We currently have our desktop set up in our living room to record PS5 footage, and I just leave the Steam Controller dongle plugged in because it's so much easier to use than finding space in our cluttered living room to use a Bluetooth mouse. Realistically, a Bluetooth trackpad or media controller would likely do this job a ton better, but it's a nifty perk for anyone with the controller on hand who wants to use it outside of just regular gameplay. Speaking of gameplay, once everything's actually connected, you can navigate to your game of choice and check out the different configurations available for that game. Almost every button can be remapped here, with the trackpads being essentially customizable as to whether they behave more like a mouse or a joystick. Seem like a lot to handle at first? No worries! With a click of a button, you can also check out any publisher or community profiles to see what control schemes others have come up with. Especially for older, more popular games, there's bound to be a few different community profiles that work well and have gained a ton of upvotes. If you don't choose a specific profile though, that's still fine. Steam will automatically load either the layout created by the developers, the most popular layout available, or a basic template recommended by the game's input scheme. When in doubt, it's easy enough to swap out these profiles too, so there's nothing really wrong with trying out the default controller setup with a game before digging too far into the weeds. After all, for some games, the default is good enough. When satisfied, also remember that big picture mode comes in extremely handy for browsing your game library with a controller. 
To launch it, you can of course open it via Steam with the button at the top right hand corner, but pressing the Steam button on the controller is much more convenient. Then when Big Pictures open, it acts more or less like it would with any other controller. Okay, so that was a lot about how to get started with this controller, but what's the controller actually like to use for gaming? Given how varied things can get with editing controller profiles, going over every single possible gameplay scenario would take much longer than we have for this video. So to make things easy, I wanted to go over three different input scenarios you'd use this controller for. One, a platformer, two, a first person shooter, and three, a management sim. Then toward the end, I'll go over a couple non-Steam gameplay examples to give a sense of how the controller feels outside of its highly customizable Steam bubble. If you want to jump to any of these specific examples, I've added chapters for easy navigation, and as always, we'll also have a handy summary at the end, synthesizing all of this info into one nice, neat little package. First up, let's try Sonic Mania. Like most 2D Sonic games, the controls for this game are pretty basic. The left joystick moves Sonic, and the face buttons can be pressed to jump or navigate menus. Without editing the controls, the Steam controller is perfectly functional. Realistically, any controller will be functional with this game. The real ask is whether it feels comfortable to use. Unfortunately, the layout is just a bit cramped here. I wouldn't call it entirely uncomfortable, but the joystick and face buttons are slightly too close together. Plus, the smallness of both don't do the controller any favors. For better default setup, platformers are the clear case where you'd probably be better off just going with the controller with a more standard layout. That seems a bit too easy though, and given the modularity of the Steam controller, if the default method isn't good enough, the next step is seeing if a different setup might work. In this case, I'm actually a real fan of going full touchpad for the controls. It completely solves the cramped layout issues and makes inputs a tiny bit quicker, with less energy needed. I still don't know if I entirely prefer this even to say an Xbox controller, but using touch controls on a controller to play Sonic on my TV is still kind of a weird idea that I really dig. Um, honestly, you could fine tune these controls even a bit more. Tweaking how the touchpads actually relate to the game and how they're interpreted by the game, plus adding additional hotkeys like for Supersonic, for example. Next, we have the flagship game of the Steam Controller, Portal 2. I chose to show this game off because this is really the best case scenario for a game utilizing the controller's various features. By default, Valve's created a custom layout with custom controller prompts specific to the Steam Controller, and for the most part, if you wanted to, you could take most of this and apply it to other first-person shooter games as well. Movement is controlled by the left joystick, as expected, the right trackpad controls aiming by emulating a mouse, and when pressed, enables gyro for extra aiming precision. They even overloaded jump and grab to both face buttons and grips to allow for a more flexible gameplay experience. And this layout works pretty well. Not gonna lie, playing Portal 2 is the first time I really appreciated the Steam Controller's unique features. Gyro support feels so good with this as does gripping the controller to grab an object. The only thing that's less than stellar is the fact that the right trackpad has a relatively short travel distance. To do a 180 without using the dedicated button, I'd need to move my thumb across the trackpad multiple times. It's not a deal breaker, 
especially since I can also flick my thumb across for quick movement, but I could potentially see swiping so many times getting tiring if I were to play longer than my typical two-ish hour play session. Still, it feels more accurate overall compared to a more standard controller, and if you're looking for a game that proves the usefulness of the Steam controller, I think this might be it. are a non-employee who has discovered this facility amid the ruins of civilization. Welcome. And remember, testing is the future, and the future starts with you. Okay, for the final Steam game, we have Planet Zoo. As a zoo sim, this game's a bit different than the others. There's no controller support whatsoever, and anyone in their right mind would probably at least default to using a mouse to select items on the screen. For science though, Emily tried the Steam controller anyway. Since there's no controller support, Steam defaulted to treating the controller like a keyboard and mouse. It's the same functionality as if you are using the controller outside Steam. And I gotta say, it actually works surprisingly well. Once Emily got used to the controls, it was fairly easy to navigate through menus and check on animals. Camera controls also feel just slightly more tactile with the trackpads, and using the scroll wheel to zoom and right grip to rotate is oddly satisfying. I can't stress enough that there's a high learning curve for sure, and at no point during testing did we consider the controller a perfect alternative to a keyboard and mouse combo. However, it's usable, which is interesting to say about using a controller with this specific type of game. By fine-tuning the controller mapping and maybe adding a few more controller shortcuts to the layout, I think this could really allow someone to play this game from a couch. Which, really, that's exactly the experience the controller was created to enable. Just expect to put in a decent amount of time customizing your controller's profile to get it just right. Okay, so for Steam games, we've seen that the controller has some real promise due to how flexibly Steam manages the controller's layouts. In a platformer, it can be a super basic controller. In a first-person shooter, it can rearrange itself into a controller-mouse hybrid with motion support. And in a mouse-heavy sim, it can forsake its controller roots altogether and completely act like a standard mouse with a half a dozen more buttons. Outside Steam, though, the controller defaults to that standard mouse mode. Typically, this is fantastic. The mouse mode is perfect for navigating windows. Everything feels about as precise as using a laptop trackpad, and the face buttons are interpreted as keyboard navigation keys. Unfortunately, that doesn't always translate well to games. To illustrate this point, we tried Destiny 2 on two different platforms, Stadia and Game Pass. In both cases, Opening the game didn't switch the controller layout from the default mouse mode. And to be honest, aiming within Destiny 2 with the controller feels great. Having the left pad as a scroll wheel to rapidly change weapons is also weirdly satisfying. Unfortunately, we only realized when inside the game that movement required the WASD keys instead of the arrow keys, which were mapped to the joystick by default. In fact, in this game, arrow keys only allow players to dance or emote, so we could literally dance if we wanted to, but we couldn't leave our starting locations behind. Worse yet, in neither instance of the game could we change the layout from within the game itself, leaving us with only the option to quit back to Windows. 
As you might guess, there are a couple easy solutions to this problem. One, you could download a program of choice to selectively remap controller buttons. If you don't want to use Steam at all, this is probably your best bet. And two, you can just go back into Steam. In Steam, you can change how the controller works by default outside of Steam games. By jumping into the configuration and swapping out the arrows on the joystick with WASD, we were able to jump right back into Destiny 2 and play the game like we would with any other controller and die an incredible amount of times like we would with any other controller. Unsurprisingly, dying actually caused us to hit additional roadblocks. You see, respawning requires you to press the E key. With prompts being keyboard keys instead of controller buttons, it was actually difficult to remember if we had that button mapped. The only way to guarantee it would be to go back to Steam to check our settings, which is kind of a hassle. We actually ended up using a Bluetooth keyboard instead, just to be sure. And that's the real pain point when using the controller outside Steam. Inside Steam games, the controller has a ton of support and very likely multiple easily accessible profiles created either by the developer, Steam, or the community. Outside Steam, the controller is completely static, barring any remapping allowed within the game itself. With enough time, effort, and knowledge of the standard control scheme for a game, players could easily set up the controller to be just as functional as within Steam. Not everyone will have that kind of patience though, and they really have no need to, given the other great controllers readily available. For someone more dedicated to make this controller work, it's more than possible it could be used for even cooler things though. And as a final example, I also wanted to demonstrate that it's not always such a hassle either. After making our thumbstick updates, we also tried out Super Hot on Stadia. Everything worked without any extra setup. Nothing about the controller felt different or revolutionary. It was literally just a solid half hour of us yelling at the TV as we died an unnecessary amount of times. If nothing else, I think this tells us something similar to Sonic Mania. Games that lack complex control schemes are likely to work without a ton of effort. Only when we start to get into games with multiple layers of controls will the Steam controller require a healthy dose of patience and tinkering. And if you're a person that likes to tinker, this controller might well be for you. To recap, the Steam controller can be quite flexible and interesting to use when playing games through Steam. In those cases, games relying mostly on the face buttons, like platformers, will likely be more comfortable to play on other controllers. Similarly, games relying heavily on a mouse and keyboard are a bit more cumbersome with the Steam controller. However, with enough tinkering, the Steam controller is still perfectly adequate in both scenarios. The controller really seems to shine in more hybrid scenarios though, like first person shooters. A great feeling trackpad and a solid gyro support go a long way to elevate the controller above other offerings. Combined with its ease of implementation and extensive community support, it's easy to recommend the Steam controller for anyone interested in playing a Steam game with a moving camera. Unfortunately, the recommendation ends when Steam closes. Outside Steam, the usefulness of the controller varies drastically and typically takes a lot of work to function perfectly. If you don't play games through Steam often, the Steam controller is only really recommended if you really enjoy tweaking settings on new devices. As I said in the beginning, this video is only really a brief look at the available options for using or modifying the Steam controller. Given that most of the new games I play are on consoles and, well, deep, my Steam library isn't all-encompassing, I'm sure there are more perspectives on this controller than I could possibly bring to the table. But how about you? If you have your experiences or thoughts on the Steam controller, why not leave them down in the comments? I'd love to read how y'all are thinking about this nifty device many years after it's been discontinued. Also, be sure to hit that like button if you like this video. It actually really does help with engagement. 
Uh, plus, be sure to get subscribed so that you don't miss any additional tech videos we release in the future. We have some pretty nifty newish smartphones and consoles on deck that I think y'all will really love. But yeah, until next time, catch you later. Well done. Here come the test results. You are a horrible person. That's what it says, a horrible person. We weren't even testing for that.